Hello, everybody. Welcome. We're so glad you're here with us tonight. Um, my name is Emily, and I will be providing technical assistance for tonight's event. Um, before we start, I just wanted to give a few technical housekeeping notes um, for all of you so you can participate um, as fully as you would like to tonight. Um, so the first order of business is just if you would like to comment um, during the event, uh, you can use the Q&A or you can use the chat uh, box. You'll see that at the very bottom. Um, so please use the chat if you have uh, any comments um, or want to uh, talk with other attendees during the event. Um, and then I also ask if you have any questions for uh, tonight's lecturer um, that you use the Q&A function, which you will find at the bottom right next to the chat. Um, so please use the Q&A for any questions tonight um, and the chat function um, to talk amongst yourselves or provide any uh, feedback or comments. Um, at the end of the event, there'll be about 15 minutes for Q&A. Um, so please put them uh, as you uh, listen in to the Q&A and they'll be answered at the end. Uh, so without further ado, thank you again uh, for coming and I will pass it over to our president, uh, Dr. David Vasquez-Levy. Thank you, Emily, and good evening. Welcome to all of you. It is great to gather together for the 2020 Georgia Harkness as well as a lecture tonight and to wish you all a happy International Pronouns Day. My name is David Vasquez-Levy and I have the pleasure of serving as president at PSR. I began this morning uh, with the news of the Pope regarding uh, what was portrayed in the news as Pope Francis voicing support for civil unions. And I immediately followed that, uh, the receiving of that news uh, it, it, with an email conversation with Bernie, Dr. Bernie Schlager, the executive director for CLGS, and Dr. Susan Abraham, the academic dean here at PSR, what I affectionately called in my email, our resident Catholics. And so I could, we engage right away into a very in-depth, thoughtful conversation about the implications of the statements uh, made by, uh, by Pope Francis in a video and their interpretation, but also the challenges that it raises about the ways that we frame our conversations about gender participation inclusion. Uh, where else can we do that? But a place like Pacific School of Religion and the work of the Center for LGBTQ and Gender Studies and Religion. This year, we celebrate the 20th anniversary of CLGS and its remarkable work. And we are thankful for the way that this uh, community has helped to shape the life and work of PSR. This is work that goes back and is rooted in generations, not only in the last 20 years of the center's work, but back to uh, the work of Georgia Harkness, uh, whose namesake uh, we celebrate today in our lecture, and we'll hear some more about her work that really began to shape PSR's uh, engagement around these critical conversations, already generations that go back in the 50s. So we are proud and welcome to uh, proud and grateful to welcome uh, back tonight for this lecture in a very appropriate way in the celebration of the 20th anniversary, Dr. Tracy West. We welcome her back to PSR, her alma mater. So thank you for being with us tonight, and I turn it over to Dr. Bernie Schlager, the Executive Director of CLGS. Looks like uh, Bernie's connection may have failed, and so he's probably trying to reconnect. We will face a few technology challenges here, but it uh, looks like he's just joining back. Uh, so again, please join me in welcoming uh, <laughs> Bernie back. <laughs> thank you. Uh, thank you, President uh, Vasquez-Levy. Good evening, everyone. As uh, President Vasquez-Levy mentioned, my name is Bernie Schlager. I'm executive director of CLGS, the Center for LGBTQ and Gender Studies in Religion, here at Pacific School of Religion in Berkeley, Cal, and remains our home. I would like to give you a warm welcome and echo uh, David's welcome to everyone here, as well as to those who will be viewing this lecture later. This is our 11th annual CLGS Georgia Harkness Lecture, 
And this evening, Reverend Dr. Tracy West will speak to us on engendering solidarity and defiant spirituality among church leaders. Dr. West, thank you for speaking this evening. Before I introduce Dr. West more fully, uh, please allow me to say a few words about this lectureship and the work of the center. And here I would also like to express the center's deep gratitude to the Women's Studies and Religion Program at the Graduate Theological Union uh, for their co-sponsorship of this lecture. The CLGS Fall Lecture Series is named in honor of Georgia Harkness, who lived from 1891 to 1974, a pioneering theologian in the Methodist tradition, a leading figure in the Christian ecumenical movement and the first woman hired to teach theology at a Christian seminary in this country. The author of more than 30 books and many articles, Harkness focused their teaching and writing on the practical application of theology to the pressing social issues of their day. Ranging from women's rights to racism, war and peace, international relations, and later in their life, full civil rights for gay and lesbian people. Harkness retired from teaching after serving on the faculty at Pacific School of Religion from 1949 to 1960. The passion that Georgia Harkness brought to their work of making vital theological connections among wider cultural and political issues, her keen interest in employing poetry and the arts in their theological work, and their firm commitment to civil rights and social justice. All of this resonates deeply with the work of Pacific School of Religion and its Center for LGBTQ and Gender Studies in Religion. As President Vasquez Levy mentioned, this current academic year, the Center is celebrating our 20th anniversary. And I invite you to check out our social media platforms for more information on the wealth of programming that we are offering through our African American, Asian Pacific Islander, Jewish, Latinx and transgender roundtables. In addition to our lecture series, lavender lunches, online book clubs, and a wide variety of other online events this year. At CLGS, we seek to serve LGBTQIA people of faith and our allies, communities of faith and the worlds of learning through a variety of programs designed in the words of our mission statement to advance the well being of queer people to transform faith communities and the wider society by taking a leading role in shaping a new public discourse on religion and sexuality through education, research, community building, and advocacy. And now to introduce more fully, Professor West. The Reverend Dr. Tracy C. West is an activist scholar who serves as the James W. Purcell Professor of Christian Ethics and African American Studies at Drew University Theological School in New Jersey. Her teaching, research, and activism have focused on gender, racial, and sexuality justice, especially as related to gender violence. Some of her major publications include Wounds of the Spirit, Black Women Violence and Resistance Ethics, Disruptive Christian Ethics When Racism in Women's Lives Matter, and most recently, Solidarity and Defiant Spirituality. Africana Lessons on Religion, Racism, and Ending Gender Violence. Professor West is also an ordained elder in the United Methodist Church and an activist for full and anti-racist LGBTQIA plus equality in that denomination. In her description of this lecture, Dr. West has written, in this political moment, how can scholar activist church leaders create common understandings that undermine patterns of society-wide abuse and intra-communal betrayal, and instead deepen their solidarity with one another? What are effective ways of expressing defiance of heteropatriarchal abuser logic and white supremacy through our spiritual resources and practices? And this lecture will include example from Dr. West's study of transnational Africana activist leadership to end gender violence. It is obvious, of course, why we were thrilled when Dr. West agreed to speak with us this evening as our 11th annual Georgia Harkness Lecturer here at CLGS and Pacific School of Religion. And so without any further ado, I present to you, Professor West.
I want to express my gratitude for this opportunity to be in conversation with you about issues of religion and race and gender and sexuality. In particular, I want to thank Dr. Schlager for being so gracious and attentive in extending the invitation. And I also want to thank Emily Cardiff for likewise being extremely gracious and helpful and skillful in helping me with the tech. Now, I am honored to be invited to offer this lecture named for my Methodist denominations scholar, teacher, leader, Georgia Harkness. Uh, as most of you probably already know, Georgia Harkness was known for her attention to global politics of war and peace, as well as a deep and active commitment to global Christianity. As United Methodists, historian Christopher Evans and Christian ethicist Rebecca Miles have pointed out, in the 1930s, Harkness quote, gave voice to a growing Christian internationalism that repeatedly called her colleagues to look to the churches of the developing world in the Southern Hemisphere. Harkness said, quote, God has more truth yet to break forth from his holy world, word, and we may look for it to break forth in Asia, Africa, South America, and the islands of the sea, unquote. My Africana decolonial work definitely has resonance with this Harkness tradition of global commitments. My most recent big project, uh, a book entitled Solidarity and Defiant Spirituality, that forms a major reference uh, point for the uh, talk that I would like to have with you today is indeed a transnational project. This work reflects a long-standing theme of my work. My teaching and writing uh, on religion, race, gender, and sexuality have been primarily focused on gender violence. Now, this project, in this project, um, Solidarity, and Defiant Spirituality, I interviewed Africana activist leaders and scholars uh, in Ghana and Brazil and South Africa whose work focuses on ending gender violence. I explored the role of religion and racism in their work and what it might mean for us here in the United States to learn from their ideas. I explored what it would mean to conceive of some notion of transnational solidarity in that common goal of ending gender violence. I spoke with the activists about their leadership and ideas and organizing strategies specifically on uh, the forms of, of gender violence that I focused on were heterosexual marital rape, primarily I had that, those conversations in Ghana, and on the sexual exploitation of uh, children by tourists, and primarily I had those conversations in Bahia in Brazil, and the targeting of black lesbians and gender non-conforming community members for rape and murder. Um, so I spoke with activists and leaders primarily in South Africa on, on um, that kind of, of gender violence work, uh, which I'm gonna reference a little bit later. Now, I hasten to add really quickly, I wanna get in that I'm not inviting you to some kind of distance, objectifying, Christian paternalistic observation of the other in the global South. But rather, I'm inviting you to venture with me into the fraught dynamics of learning from intercultural transnational encounter and the possibilities for solidarity that are within those encounters. So method is crucial. It's a crucial dimension in the content of our justice work. So I want you to note that Georgia Harkness was known um, for her methodological disciplinary stance as an applied theologian. 
She was in fact criticized and in some cases derided for being an applied theologian. As a pioneering woman uh, teaching in a seminary, her teaching was sometimes not appreciated uh, as historian Rosemary Skinner Keller summarized, quote, it wasn't appreciated for, quote, closely relating theological inquiry to social justice and the practice of ministry, unquote. My methodological moorings resonate with this Harkness tradition as well. Uh, I invite you to be fully immersed in a dialogue between theory and practice. That's the only way I know how to do this work. The ways in which we conceptualize systemic white supremacist sanctions for gender violence directly illumine communal practices, including church practices, and even the capacity to creatively imagine the liberative meanings of a blackened transnational and intercultural solidarity in disrupting those systemic sanctions for violence. It requires some reference to actual shared lived realities, experiences and practices that exhibit our capacity to depend on each other and learn from each other conceptualizing and practices, they're in a dialogical relationship. So I want to stress how I am interested, especially in the ways in which scholar activist church leaders can create common understandings that undermine society-wide patterns of abuse and intracommunal betrayal. And instead, instead of uh, um, being so tied and moored and constrained by that abuse and betrayal, how can we instead deepen our solidarity with one another? You know, sometimes I think that my own bisexual identity lived out for most of my life with a heterosexual partner, uh, that that both the how bisexual identity always retains access to the space of heterosexual privilege and heterosexual status, as well as the bi erasure, erasure in queer thought and queer communities, that the combination of both of those status and privilege and erasure, it sometimes I think that energizes my interest in betrayals and solidarities. Or maybe my lone lifelong journey as a Black United Methodist, baptized as an infant in a Protestant denomination, United Methodism, that to this day retains a membership of over 90% white people in the United States, at least, United States mem membership. But maybe that instigates this interest in betrayals and solidarity. I don't know. I don't know. But I do know that finding ways to collaboratively undermine abuse and betrayals is absolutely crucial for creating the kind of solidarity in ending gendered violence that I want us to be committed to. So this, this moment, this is a moment, right? This moment, this 2020 moment is a time when there is so much public attention to systemic issues. We can really focus on society-wide patterns of abuse and intracommunal betrayals and how they're related to violence in this moment in so many ways. We can become bolder in her, our defiance of abuser logic that thrives in its insistence on isolation. Abuser logic is part of the logic that keeps us in those kinds of betrayals and society-wide abuse. Um, and ab abuser logic isolates the person who is victimized and stresses how bodily uh, violation and emotional abuse is just an isolated incident. You know, uh, abuser logic is, is something like, I may control who you can text, but I never hit you. I may have allowed my eight-year-old daughter to playfully touch my genitals until arousal, but she flirts with me. She enjoys playing around. 
or we may, we had sex when you were drunk and totally out of it, but it was just that one time, right? This, this is a moment of defiance of that minimizing, isolated incident, deep betrayal abuser logic. This moment of, of, of protest when so many people all around the world are collectively expressing that they have run out of patience with violence and abuse and indifferent, indifference to basic bodily human rights that, um, that are based on um, the, the, the indifference to, the, to basic, basic um, concern for those bodily human rights. They've run out of patience with all the ways in which violent abuse and st of state police power is nurtured by a deeply embedded sense of racist entitlement. We, this is a moment when we can, we can almost feel the intense vulnerability, almost feel the intense vulnerability of, of being a Brianna Taylor and being at home in your bed, asleep and almost understand what it means that after she was shot to death by the police, a black, a Kentucky black prosecutor claimed that that shooting was, was justified. Um, that, that, that when we can experience that moment of um, in, in this 2020 moment of, of listening to Reverend uh, Bernice King speaking at the about the civil rights leader at the memorial service of civil rights leader and LGBTQ rights, uh, civil rights advocate, John Lewis, remember? She was speaking at his memorial service and remembering her fervent opposition, right? To same gender loving people's right to get married in Georgia as a civil right. And how she famously, that famous quote uh, when she was when she was leading marches and fighting against um, uh, marriage equality, she said, "My father did not take a bullet for same-sex marriage." Right? We can we can experience right in this 2020 year that horrible, tragic, gut-wrenching plane crash, killing basketball star Kobe Bryant, his child and several other people on that plane. And in the aftermath, one black male celebrity inciting violence against a black woman cele so, um, celebrity national news anchor for even mentioning the sexual assault accusations against Bryant that had been such a significant part earlier in his career. This is a moment when we have to grapple with issues of race and nation and cultures and fueling anti-LGBTQIA plus hate violence. The United Methodist Church is a case study in how the church fuels such violence. Now with its so-called traditional plan globally in place um, and taken effect since January 1, um, not only maintaining the innate superiority of heterosexuals, uh, but also, uh, but also making a more ex uh, a more efficient expulsion of those who are lesbian and gay and transgender, queer, uh, plus plus their allies in in the church can more efficiently be be um, booted from the church, and the United Methodist Church grappling with the Black African United Methodist conferences and bishops who seemingly en mass support those policies and thereby sacrifice the, sef the safety of African LGBTQ Christian community members who are imperiled by hate violence in Africa. But at the same time, the United Methodist Church, right? Not, not grappling with the role of Russian delegate support for the same plan and the implications for the conditions of Russian LGBTQI community members who are imperiled by hate violence in Russia, not naming the whiteness of the white US Southern supporters or the whiteness of the white U, uh, mid US, mid-Atlantic US um, supporters of the traditional plan. This is a moment. We're breaking out of abuser logic. 
means confronting multiple patterns of transnational and national community-wide betrayals of human dignity, of freedom, of human worth. Now, I, I'm particularly interested in gender violence. That is, in confronting patterns of gender violence and its imprint and its expression as Christian-based racism. Gender violence is a form of racism. Gender violence is a form of racism. U.S. Americans should understand this, right? You should understand this because our history, because of our history, we're culturally saturated with abuser logic of denial. Our cultural understanding of moral exceptionalism denies the depth of our cultural commitment to gender violence. I, as I cited in this um, Solidarity and Defiant Spirituality Project, Joe Biden asserts that world leaders look to us. Uh, he, said, he said that we are trying, quote, we are trying to ex export to other nations, unquote, our globally exceptional consensus on uh, opposing gender violence. That's a typical form of denial of a failure to confront historical embeddedness of racist rape culture, right? One of my examples that I often, often point to of this embedded historical legacy is uh, uh, Thomas Jefferson's 1776 Declaration of uh, of uh, independence assertion, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, and the pursuit of happiness, that alongside of that assertion is the fact of his rape of his 14-year-old slave, Sally Hemings, when he was uh, approximately 40 years of old, 40 years of age. Note that the invocation of the notion of that human freedom and equality, he includes this idea of how um, we're endowed by our creator. In those iconic words Jefferson penned in, the in, the, in that Declaration of Independence, there's the divine imprimatur of rape tolerance tradition that's embedded in a US society. And no matter what your racial or ethnic origins might be, all who reside in this US nation, all who reside in this US nation inherit are morally formed by this legacy of divinely blessed hypocrisy and valorization of Thomas Jefferson's words of his iconic message of his of the ways in which he, a child rapist, Thomas Jefferson, is valorized. Finding solidarity in the confrontation of that reality can be difficult. I can hear some of you. I can hear you asking, is that my racial group's history? Is that my ethnic group's history? Or is that, that's that sad fact, that rape of Sally Hemings, that's black history, that's sad black history. But I say no, confronting the moral influence, the collective moral disciplining of this Nash in this national history, that confrontation, it's, it's tough work, but it's a crucial step in the solidarity work that I'm calling us to. Now that past, in that past, that solidarity work, it means recognizing that legacy as well as confronting our current realities of rape culture. The ways in which our current racist anti-immigrant rhetoric and policy exemplifies transnational racist rape culture. The current federal right, uh, uh, white nationalism gives practical expression to anti-Brown and anti-Black racism that fosters gender violence, not just uh, in the rhetoric 
of Mr. Trump's, uh, such as that um, iconic instance of Mr. Trump uh, in that uh, 2018 meeting, you know, that conversation he was in uh, with all of these high level, high level senators uh, from across political parties. And he, they were discussing asylum policy um, and immigration policy for migrants, including migrants uh, that, were, that are coming up from the South and seeking asylum because they're fleeing gender violence, uh, such as gang rape and femicide. And remember how at the meeting reportedly, uh, Trump said, quote, why do we want all these people from Africa here? Uh, they're shithole countries. We should have more people from Norway." Unquote. Now we know. Now we know that he expressed what so many in the public believe. And I want to say, no doubt some of you listening to me have some version of that narrative in your head, some version of that narrative that he gave such frank and honest expression to that makes what I'm saying methodologically strain your imagination, that an encounter with Black Africana, Af Africana activist leaders is a crucial way of us receiving the, the knowledge and the strategy and the ways in which we can be energized and informed and, and work and enabled to do the unlocking of systemic support for gender violence here in the United States. Yep, comments such as Trump's, as well as policies, policies, specific policies put in place by United Methodist, for example, United Methodist Jeff Sessions, who invoked scripture as he put in place the zero tolerance white nationalist policy of caging and kidnapping brown migrants to ensure, he also ensured specifically created a specific policy at the same time that would make, that made intimate violence, domestic violence, no longer a criteria that can be considered for asylum. Christian, activist leaders such as yourselves, some of you out there, such as myself, finding solidarity to confront these examples of anti-Brown racist rape culture. Some of you might be whispering to yourselves, how does this rape supporting anti-Brown racism get incorporated into a Black Lives Matter priority? or how should it get incorporated? These examples of the present transnational racist rape culture and these kinds of hypocrisies about political equality, all with explicit divine sanction, they are an agenda for the kind of solidarity work that we must do, but it is difficult. Finally, I want to give an example of engendering defiant spirituality in a communal way that comes from my book project and specifically when I was in South Africa. I, I met these leaders of a group called Free Gender and this group uh, works Free Gender, these leaders of Free Gender, they work on uh, a collective action to uh, form alliances among Black, lesbians, bisexual, transgender, and intersex women as an essential part of building solidarity and creating change uh, to end the targeting of uh, lesbians and non-conforming um, gender, people who are non-conforming in their gender expression and presentation, who are members of their communities and the ways in which they're targeted for violence and trying to end that targeting in a systemic way, confronting police officers and the courts. So I was meeting with them and I wanna give this example of how I stepped into their space and the ways in which I was introduced to this 
open and affirming space, this free gender space, as a space where gender expression, especially by Black lesbians, especially masculine expressions of Black lesbian, uh, expressions of what it means to be a Black lesbian, that there was this sense of this was a freeing space where leaders came together to defy the conditions of the threat of gang rape and murder. And, and in front of me, I'm just going to read one little section from this uh, uh, moment as I stepped into the room and I saw this big red cloth with this writing on it that listed uh, the members of their community who had been assaulted, but it gave numbers. So it said one, three, two, five, rape, seven, five, oh, five, 20, 2009, rape, right? Rape, rape, murder, murder, suicide, murder, assault. An ominously empty red space of fabric was left below the last notation on the list. As the possibility entered my mind that more cases could be inserted in that space, I guiltily rushed it away as if my thoughts could invite such tragedies. The cloth linking different types of violence together as it bore witness to the communities, costs and losses. Acknowledgement of the suicides, assaults, murders, and rapes on the red cloth seem to constitute a spirituality of politicized collective grieving, like the Black Lives Matter protests, this politicized collective grieving. It claims space to grieve in the impetus to pursue justice in the courts the cloth marked the group's timeless allegiance to the lives of the victimized Black lesbians, confirming a spiritual and political tether that defied the final ending their torturers had sought. The spirituality generated a defiant continuity that is a refusal to accept neither the final breach in the mystery of death by murder or suicide, nor the perpetrator's last words to survivors in the psychic theft that accompanied the brutality and bodily invasion of the assaults. This form of intervention on the meaning of space and time was particularly crucial in the aftermath of violence intended to send a threatening communal message about the reducibility of Black lesbian humanity to objects vulnerable to attacks at any moment in any public space. I'm going to skip down. I just want to read another section. Some in this group, some of them were Christians, some of them were not. And free gender members uh, that were gathered there, they started to sing. And the a cappella harmony filled the room. They sang, we glorify your name with the melodious wail of the lead voice followed by an echo response by the other singers. We glorify, we glorify your name. They sang in English, then in Hosa, and then in English again with a slow, steady tempo. The tune slid up and down the scale in a heart-wrenching choral invocation of sacred spirit. The naked beauty of their voices enveloped the room, gripped me, held me. The comfort of their voices offered, that their voices offered coexisted alongside of my captivity to that red cloth hanging with its black letters I swayed to the music, tried to sing with them and swallow tears before they were seen. The repeated line, we glorify your name, the glory attributed to the unnamed one whose existence was honored in the lyric pointed to both a divine spirit as well as the victimized lives of those unnamed on the red cloth. 
divine spirit and black lesbian humanity, in some cases murdered or dead by suicide, were spiritually present. Their intermingled sacredness was implicit in the words, your name. And then I describe also the ways in which the kind of defiance that took place and that I experienced in that room resonated with defiance also that, I, um, that occurred here uh, where I live, which is in the Newark, New Jersey area where Sakia Gunn, a lesbian uh, teenager was killed, a gender non-conforming uh, teenager was killed because of her gender non-conforming and her saying to her killer before he killed her that she, that, that, uh, she was not into men. Um, and then he stabbed her to death and the ways in which at the funeral, the uh, church, uh, a black LGBTQ church and the pastor and the leaders intervened um, at the memorial service between angry youth and the police. And they created this spiritual activist space honoring dignity. So I want to also give you one more example at the end of that meeting. It was hosted by, uh, as this meeting came to an end, a free gender member of the, of the group spoke up and she started out tentatively and admitting that she was wondering what Elizabeth, um, that's the person who had hosted me and, and who was a local leader there in South Africa, um, working on gender violence, all form, many forms of gender violence and had introduced me to the free gender group was there. And so this member of the group wondered what we thought of the church songs that they were singing. And uh, she referred to me as one of the pastors. And she talked about her previous experience in her life of having been rejected by Christian leaders and how she stated then in our meeting, um, she stated that Christian pastors think homosexuals should not be allowed to sing church songs. And then she looked at me with increased self-assurance and assertiveness. And she reminded me that a discussion linking Christianity and homosexuality was a very sensitive topic. And in that moment, my association with Christianity had engendered distrust and vulnerability. It cast doubt upon whether she could or should openly express her Christian faith in my presence because she was a, she was a lesbian. It had delivered the opposite, opposite effect uh, from what I had intended, what I had desired, or what I was experiencing um, as I listened to the spirituality and experience them singing in that group. I felt the homophobic terrorizing impact of our religion, her religion, my religion, and the impediments to solidarity it spawned between us. Once more, Christian spirituality could not be disconnected from its harmful political tentacles, especially for any conceptualization of spirituality that informed activist solidarity in working to end the violence. In that moment of confrontation and encounter, there was a glimpse of blackening solidarity that we need because of its capacity and commitment to interrogate white supremacist, colonialist, imperialist abuser logic in the room that fuels anti-LGBTQIA plus hate violence and other forms of gendered violence. This kind of defiant spirituality, this kind of defiant spirituality fuels the blackening solidarity. The defiant spirituality is a kind of collective encounter spirituality that is evocative of truth-telling 
intercultural, transnational possibility. Thank you. Professor West, thank you again uh, for your powerful words. Uh, and I will always remember uh, many things, but especially that phrase, defiant spirituality uh, and blackening spirituality. Um, now it's time for our questions, but I, I did want to repeat that we, we are really honored by your presence here again. And so thank you. And uh, neither David nor I mentioned that you are an alum of Pacific School of Religion. So that makes us doubly, triply um, honored. Thank you. No, I'm delighted to be here. And I think David did mention that. Oh, I, he did. Okay. Okay. I was probably I, offline at that I point. Uh, okay. I'm Good. Different. Yes. So uh, uh, folks, if you could use the Q&A uh, box for questions, we have one Professor West already. Uh, Dr. West, could you say more about the role of collective grieving in solidarity? You touched on that with the stories of the banner and the funeral. Yes, you know, I one of I was so impressed with the opportunity to have this encounter with some of these with with some of these leaders, and particularly in that example, I was in Cape Town, and so it was an opportunity to be able to think about what kinds of resources, how do we, in, 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 in encountering one another, how do we learn from that context and recognize some of the common tools and strategies and also some of the differences and ways in which uh, we have conflicting and tension filled and, um, uh, ways of relating a kind of imperialism, exceptionalism, Christian paternalism, that's all part of uh, some of those exchanges. And one example I wanted to give is the ways in which grieving is a recogn recognition of human dignity and worth and this collective process is this kind of politicized process that 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 the in which that group free gender was engaging, um, and how it's important to recognize uh, the politicized confrontation um, as part of the ways in which honoring of that of the human worth and dignity of someone who has been targeted for hate violence uh, for gendered hate violence uh, as well as other forms of gender violence. And I just quickly um, gave a quick on the side, this isn't in that text, but I said, you know, I, I hope that we recognize the demonstrations that have and protests that have been occurring many places as this politicized collective form of grieving. I hope that we recognize that in those in these protests that part of what we're doing is recognizing the dehumanizing that occurs in, in, this, in the racist uh, state violence and killings uh, that have occurred, such as Breonna Taylor's uh, killing. And so I'm, I'm really uh, wanting to be in conversation with you about whether or not you can, you can see grief and collective grieving as having that politicized dimension um, as a form of creating solidarity uh, across differing uh, kinds of activist groups um, and uh, activist scholar groups, as well as um, community and church and religious leadership um, that, that, that it, it, it expands our moral imagination by also gr and grounds our moral imagina imagination for the kind of grief and change and transformation we wanna create by, uh, um, honoring particular individuals who have been killed. <clears throat> Thank you, Dr. West. Another question has come in. Uh, here it is. Thank you for your moving talk. Curious how you approach sacred texts that have historically been used to validate biases. Yes. Well, 
you know, if if you were, if I was able to speak with you, the person who asked that question, I think I would say, and um, Bernie, do you mind if I dialogue with you to sort of riff off of that question? Sure, and of just course. say, do you think of the Declaration of Independence quote that I gave as a kind of sacred text? I do. Yeah. As a kind of uh, as a kind of civil religion, a sacred text of our civil religion. Yeah. And so uh, in some ways I'm trying to give an example of a wide range of sacred texts, obviously in our traditions, in our religious tradition, scripture is is the place that um, I'm that perhaps the person who raised this question really want, is thinking about, and of course I can think about that, but I also want us to see how we are disciplined, morally disciplined by civil religious uh, sacred texts like that Declaration of Independence and the kind of actions, active lived life of rape, um, of, of, of a slave, of you know Jefferson slave, um, and this kind of white supremacist rape culture sort of that hypocrisy disciplines us to erase the impact um, and it disciplines us to erase rape as a part of the white supremacist racist um, hypocrisy of that kind of religious text. Um, so, I, so I just wanted to raise that as an example of me trying to think through what are the implications, what are the collective implications of the ways in which we are influenced by sacred text uh, in that way. And certainly, absolutely, certainly. Um, there and and there are other um, other kinds of of sacred texts. Again, I, I know I'm I'm I, I I'm not talking about Bible, um, and I could talk about Bible um, even though I'm not a biblical scholar. But I want to give another example that is uh, uh, the Martin Luther King's "I Have a Dream" speech. Uh, it, it's a kind of a text that that takes on this quality of civil religion in in civil religion. This narrative of uh, of Martin Luther King is invoked by extreme by by extremely conservative um, leaders, and the uh, executive order of President Trump that just came out. I think it was October twenty second. That just the uh, I'm sorry, September 22nd, I'm sorry, it came out recently anyway. So it came out recently, the executive order um, about uh, the teaching of racism and sexism. You, you know, this recent Trump executive order yeah. um, where he's withdrawing any federal contracts that uh, in any way teach about or any, or any organizations that are given grants by the federal government that teach about racism and sexism um, in a way that, that does not adhere to these principles that he lays down. And primarily those principles have to do with not making white people feel bad about themselves. Um, so, but it is, but it is, it's a historic, it's a historic, really important implementation of white nationalism in terms of its control of thought. Um, so I want us to recognize that executive order and the ways in which its implementation has all of these implications. And it even has an, a reference to our, uh, the ways in which we talk about racism and teach about racism in academic settings um, and a suggestion that that must be done in a so-called objective way um, and in accord with the guidelines that it gives. Um, but I just want you all to look up that statement and look at the ways in which Black people are object lessons, are used as object lessons, and specifically uh, a bl Black clergy person, Martin Luther King Jr., is invoked by Trump, not once, more than once, and specifically the I Have a Dream speech, and specifically his the ways in which uh, Martin Luther King talked about uh, about judging people by the content of their character. And, and so uh, I'm giving an example of the use of certain understandings that convey a sense of equality and 
but are used in our civil religion, in this case, to further a white nationalist agenda, right? But many people, perhaps even many people listening to this talk will get up on January 15th, unfortunately, in my view, um, unfortunately, because it's just so pathetically reductionist of Martin Luther King Jr. to keep referring to I have a dream. But anyway, that's a different uh, conversation. Um, but, um, but use text as a way to, um, to, to silence and erase and divert um, attention and also to um, relativize uh, the kind of important anti-racism, anti-black racism, anti-brown racism work that we need to do. Um, so anyway, so those, those are some thoughts that do not directly address that we absolutely need to study and think about uh, sacred texts within scriptural traditions and the ways in which those are used. Um, and for me as an ethicist, I'm always interested in how scripture is used and claimed often to abuse. So it's a source of authority. It becomes a source of authority that fits very much into the abuser logic that I was describing in this talk. And it becomes a source of authority that is claimed by leaders to often bludgeon people and hurt people and sanction uh, sexual violence, gender violence, domestic violence, um, and, and abuse and abuse um, that occurs in, re in relationships. And so, and so for me, we always want us to think about um, what does it mean to use scripture? And what are the power dynamics in your use of scripture? Uh, and, and that has to be to me at the heart of the ways in which we think about our understanding of scripture, that it's, it, it, it's something there that, that we're grabbing its authority, thereby grabbing uh, the authority of, of the divine often um, and understanding it as simply a tool for um, maintaining, justifying certain kinds of, of power and control. Yeah, it's interesting you uh, you know mentioning the Declaration of Independence, having grown up as a child and teenager at least in nearly all white environments and a very religious household. Um, my schooling taught me that questioning something like these civil documents uh, was worse than questioning the Bible, <laughs> because we were told this is what holds us together. If we start pulling things out, everything will crumble. Of course, there are lots of other reasons things are crumbling, <laughs> not to do with that, but. Yeah, it's interesting. Uh, yes, absolutely, absolutely. The, 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 the act of asking a question and most importantly, asking a question about the power interests that are served um, is so often repressed in formal educational and unfortunately in formal religious settings. Mm -hmm. that, that is, that is, not allowed, um, or in some ways it's threatening. Um, it's threatening as opposed to the opposite, it, it's, it's generative. Um, and how do we understand the act of questioning, especially in relationship to power and authority, and for me, power and control, the, the exercise of power and control over others that fits so nicely into a kind of white supremacist um, practices, not just rhetoric, but practices that are implemented um, in, in so many ways. Uh, and currently I, I'm giving examples of, of racist rape culture in relationship to anti-migrant and anti-immigrant policies. Thank you. There are some more questions, if I might. Uh, so Reverend Dr. West, I'm curious as to how one's theology also impacts abuser logic. I'm thinking specifically of the penal atonement theory and how it attributes to a Christian justification of abuser logic. Is this theological understanding something that we as Christians can still hold on to when we address systems of oppression? How do we hold space for those who do? I am, can you, can you please, I'm sorry, can you repeat the part of a penal atonal, atonement theology? Thank yeah, you. Theory. Sure, of course. Um, and then maybe this uh, question or that question, and I'm a, I'm worried I'm not going to do it justice. I, yeah. I have to just admit There's, that. 
There's a lot in there and maybe the questioner, uh, so, okay, uh, penal substitution. So let me reread it. Um, I'm curious to know how one's theology also impacts abuser logic. I'm thinking specifically of the penal substitution theory and how it attributes to a Christian justification of abuser logic. Um, is this theological understanding something that we as Christians can still hold on to when we address systems of oppression? How do we hold space for those who do? Yeah, I, I am really intrigued by that question and the, especially the ways in which we have theology that justifies any notion of sacrifice um, and that the, of, of a human being and also torture, literal physical torture um, was atoning, that that, that punishment um, was, was, had a benefit to it. And how do we, and how do we hold on to the physical torture and torment um, and also there's, to me, there's also this, this sexual bodily part of this naked body being tormented um, and in that slow prolonged death and understand that as something that is good and beneficial. Um, I, 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 I don't, yeah, I don't, for me, I don't understand how that logic allows us to think about the role of the state. And so I guess I'm always wanting to talk to people who talk about that kind of atonement theology. Now help me understand the role of the state, the Roman state, and the kind of singling out of Jews for punishment, you know, the, the ways in which the class of, of a a certain group of people um, were punished in a particular way by the Roman state. Um, that there's there is a there's a there's a way in which there's a collective human decision making about power that I I I need to be in more conversation with people who are thinking about atonement to understand um, where they're coming from because it's just not my starting point, which allows us to understand, frankly. Um, the kind of resistance to that kind of punishment um, that I think that example calls us to and specifically resistance to that kind of abuse of power and authority by the state um, and, and, and the way in which it insists on that kind of bodily torture. Um, as something that's good. Um, so anyway, so those are the kinds of things, but an allowing space in my view means trying to allow space for uh, us to be in conversation and try to figure out where we can possibly meet since I'm so strongly opposed to, um, to violence <laughs> and um, state sanctioned violence as well as intimate violence. Um, as well as hate violence uh, carried out by groups. Thank you. Uh, another, there are a lot of good pieces. So maybe should we get a few of these, a few ideas? Sure, please, please. Why don't you go ahead and give us a few folks ideas? Cause these are great. Yeah, and I'm not uh, going to speak to every single one but, but maybe we could just hear a few of them. Sure, so should I read a bunch of them? Is, yeah, uh, put them into yeah. this space? Sure. Yeah. Um, uh, here's one, that ethical focus on how scripture is used for good or bad purposes also reminds me of Elizabeth Johnson's teaching, quote, the symbol of God functions, end quote. So how does it function? Whom does it benefit? Here's another, in the US where gender violence is so infused with life, what specific form of confrontation or defiant spirituality surrounding gender violence and combating white supremacist abuser logic have you found most evocative and effective? And are there any specific movements of solidarity you would recommend we explore and or come alongside? Uh, let me read another one. Um, I'm not sure of this first word, but offer, suggest, 
ways to avoid misinterpretation of cultural and philosophical differences that are exacerbated by not learning the languages of others while assuming we understand what others mean when groups learn speak English. Distorting the meanings inherent in a language tends to create a distorted mirror of English. The meanings are often, uh, often become concretized and amplified. Um, uh, and then the person who had the atonement question, uh, Reverend Dr. West, thank you so much for taking what I realized now is quite a curveball of a question. Very grateful for your help in starting to put some of those pieces together. Thank you. Thank you. Those are those are such helpful questions. And another, there are cultures who use divinities as exemplars rather than models. Which do you prefer? You know, I I want to just come back to a couple of pieces here that are, um, these are all extremely helpful ways to be in conversation. Um, but I, I wanna pick up on this, uh, who, who benefits? I think that is a helpful way for us to think about um, what about the kind of resistance that occurs as we try to form the trust that's so necessary for building solidarity um, is to that's that's just that's a nice helpful reminder of a tool we can grab onto um, and focus on because so often um, I, I want to say that when I'm talking about solidarity, I'm not talking about ally, right? So that's a different that's a different kind of way of forming relationship, the ally relationship and building allies. Not uh, Please, I'm not saying that's not important. Absolutely, allyship is important, um, but allyship often depends upon being very clear that one is supporting someone else who is targeted. Um, and, and so you're not part of the targeted group and you're doing whatever you can to leverage your privilege to support the targeted group. So, so who benefits is the targeted group, right? So that's a very different kind of understanding. And solidarity, I am talking much more about this process that you enter into that is, that is wholly interdependent that is that it, you're that you're in that's innovating that it's innovative as you are encountering one another and recognizing the ways in which you betray one another by certain kinds of allegiances and complicities right and you also envision certain kinds of resources and possibilities that you can create through learning and recognizing patterns that are very different from the kinds of patterns that in which you are engaged in trying to transform, right? So the differences, um, the dissonance that you experience can become a resource to the ways in which you create this kind of, a kind of solidarity. But, the, but, but paying attention to the ways in which you seek to benefit your, that you're trying to grab something from someone else so that you can benefit your own communal well being right in your own group of people um, that that's something that you that you that you want to guard against and you want to be attentive to that you're not trying to take exploit use um, for your own um, benefit um, that that's not what it means to be in solidarity. Uh, and that there's this kind of constant interdependent and also tension um, of difference that is a resource that is a positive resource. Um, so I, I just I, I just wanted to to pick up on that piece because I think it's a really nice um, yeah, thank you piece. And, and there are there are several other um, pieces that you just read that I could also pick up on. 
I don't know. Do you want to add or remind me of something? Uh, sure. So, um, uh, are there any specific movements of solidarity you would recommend? Uh, that that was part of one of the the latter questions. Um, and then the person who asked the question originally about sacred texts uh, then had a follow up about um, you know the Declaration of Independence, and they say yes, I agree. The text does say all men. If slaves are not I'll add, considered to be human and women don't count, then it's an accurate text rather than an aspirational one. Yes, um, yes, yes. Uh, let's see. Yep, was... yep, no, that's really, that's really helpful. That's really helpful. And, and I mean, I am so interested in uh, gender, gender violence movements. So I am especially interested in transnational movements related to gender violence because because I think given who we are who are po how our populations are moving across the world not just not just uh uh north and south americas not I'm not just talking about the americas I'm talking about migrant populations all over the world and issues related to migrant populations all over the world um whether people are fleeing uh climate migrants or people are fle fleeing authoritarian uh, dictatorships and, and repression uh, in that fleeing so often is experience of sexual violence whether people are fleeing experiences in their in their home settings that they're, where they're leaving some form of violence uh, intimate violence uh, domestic violence or in the passage, in in this in the journey of of crossing borders, um, there is the experience of um, gender violence. So often um, is a part of that experience, and uh, and and lots of other examples um, that I have given that the nature of who we are is this kind of uh, transnational. Um, community and and even if you if you just think about if you just think about the popularity of the current U.S. president uh, and, and the ways in which um, the use of immigrant um, stigmatizing of immigrants racist stigmatizing I'm not just talking about rhetorically um, I was listening to this report that said Trump had put in over 400 anti immigrant measures had implemented I just keep wanting us to come back to the the practices not just the rhetoric the practices and the popularity of that right across as that that the 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 rise of 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 implementing white nationalist policies linked to brown and black migrant populations and so the importance to me of, of the kind of resistance movements and solidarity movements um, that have this understanding of how do we work together, understand each other as needing to work together across some of these boundaries and learn from each other um, and learn from how this kind of, uh, my work is especially actually been anti-black anti -black and anti-brown transnational intercultural forms of, of, of racism, but how we join in solidarity and recognizing the kind of, of violence that's furthered in those practices mm -hmm. and, and take on the systemic, right? So that's why I keep coming back to these kind of systemic framing understandings because they're the ones driving the popularity and the indifference to the human suffering, right? Like it's profound, the kind of indifference, right? To the human suffering uh, of, the, of these bodies. And, and, and so I am I'm just continue to be very, very, very inspired um, by, uh, these kinds of transnational movements. Um, and then I also give the church example as well um, because I'm involved in the United Methodist Church and particularly um, a movement called the UN Forward Movement of, for Equality. Um, 
and and so the ways in which that has to be a transnational uh, movement because of uh, the uh, role that global church leaders are playing in this uh, politics of, mm -hmm. of the church. But you know, UMC, that's just a case study specific example, though it is a pretty large denomination and one in which Georgia Harkness was active. That's right, thank you. I, are you open to one more question or comment? Okay, we're or, last. Yeah, okay. Like uh, and this, this comes from me and I think, and from some of what I've seen in the Q and A box. So with this, this idea, it's more than an idea, an actuality of blackening solidarity in your book, Solidarity and Defiant Spirituality, what does this transnational Africana movement look like? Is, is it okay to call it a movement? Is there much um, a dialogue, say between Bahia and Ghana with among communities? Um, I mean, I know that you bring this together in your book. I'm curious to know if there is a, um, a transnational movement around uh, that is one of blackening solidarity. Yes, I, um, you know, that's, that's a great, that's really helpful for me to clarify. I was attempting to conceptualize what to, to what, what does it mean to name what this process of learning looks like, sounds like, feels like of encounter and, and, and how these differing settings and leaders help me to create this conceptualization. Um, so I think that's more accurate than to say I was describing an existent movement because that's not what, what I was doing. It was an attempt to say, especially for folks who are, who are US Blacks, there's a, there's a relationship to West Africa because of uh, slave history, a, a, a large portion, not all, but a large portion of folks who were kidnapped from Africa during the transatlantic slave trade came from that West Africa. So, so that West Africa, that Ghana, it's important to be in conversation, and that was important. Why to why that converse, that conversation, those leaders. Although I wasn't looking at the historical period, but that's sort of why it's important to make that connection in the contemporary moment with that part of the world, uh, and then and then um, Brazil, the the largest number of African slaves that came to the Americas came to Brazil. That, that's US people, US, a really, it's a really tiny number compared to the numbers that came to Brazil. Um, so the importance of spending some time there and understanding the legacy and also the broader uh, religious traditions, Yoruba based uh, traditions, um, particularly Condeble in that setting that informed this broader notion of spirituality um, beyond uh, say Christianity and Islam. So, so I'm just giving a couple of examples and of course South Africa because of its uh, anti-apartheid movement and, uh, and the ways in which uh, you, 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 no, there's nothing that you discuss politically there without discussing racism. Um, and so if I'm looking at people who are for whom anti-racism is at the core of any kind of work, political work that they do, including work on gender violence, that's a, that's a place that's you just gotta go to get models mm -hmm. and expand your thinking anyway. So I'm just giving examples of why it was yeah. important for me as I formulated what kind of blackening uh, process this kind of solidarity needs to sound like and look like. And I'm deliberately trying to undermine this kind of metaphor of whitening, purifying Christianity, mm -hmm. which is such an important tradition. And, uh, and Africa as this uh, deep dark continent of darkness and backwardness. Mm -hmm. And to use President Trump's language, shithole, um, which many, many US folks, including liberals, mm -hmm. are not able to think of Africa as a place of ideas. That's like, no, 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 what do you mean? So, so I'm trying to undermine that those kinds of racist logics in the ways in which I am conceptualizing or inviting us to conceptualize and think about uh, what kind of, of notion of solidarity we might create, um, but, but not charting a particular movement. Yeah, yeah. Um, 
Well, uh, Dr. West, thank you. Um, uh, wonderful to have you again. I realized, um, I think the first time you spoke at CLGS was in 2004 or so. Oh my ago. goodness. Yeah, so it was a while back. And so wonderful to have you. Thank you. Uh, thank you for your lecture. Thank you for taking questions and comments. And uh, we recorded this and once it is uh, edited just a bit, it will be up on our website. So. Thank, thank you, you so much. And thank all of you who are out there in um, putting comments and questions and um, some response in the chat. I, I, I wish I could see you, but it does help me so much to hear from you and to see that you're present and, and thinking with me. And uh, so I, I want to express my appreciation to all of you because it helps because of this format is so odd um, that I can't actually see you. So it's really great. <laughs> Uh, to, to hear those uh, pieces in the chat. Um, and thank you, um, uh, all of you at the center and- um, Thank you. President Vasquez Levy, and especially thank you, Emily. Yes, thank you, Emily. Uh, make <laughs> all of this actually uh, work uh, because uh, there's, I'm intimidated by the technology and, and you made it easy. So. Yeah, they always do. Uh, so thank you, everyone. Uh, uh, check out our website for other programs. Our next major lecture will be April 15th with Lama Rod Owens. Uh, so thanks again for attending this evening and um, have a good rest of your afternoon, evening or night. Take care. <laughs>